Belly to belly is a really weird move for me that sort of doesn't always work, but Yokozuna, man, it looks devastating. Is, has there ever been a tag team where the two have broke up and had the same level of success? That's an interesting question. Coco Beware and Owen Hart look like they've taken fashion advice from either Timmy the Mallet or Mr. Motivator. Both. Probably both. Probably both. Yeah. Can you roll your eyes? <laughs> that's, that's a no. <laughs> Hello and a very warm welcome back to the Gimme a Whole Year Wrestling Podcast. My name is Dom and you are? Whole oh, Year. And, <laughs> go on. <laughs> and we're doing, what the fuck are we doing again? We're doing Survivor Series 1992 honestly, today. Honestly, I've been off for a while. <laughs> we have been away for a long time. I am uh, we're, we're losing back. it. I'm losing it. And now we're back. <laughs> and we can, better than ever. Better, clearly better than ever. <laughs> yes. Uh, Anthony, how have you been? Good, man. Good. good. It's all good. It's nice you to see are you. currently been... in America right now as this video is released. Yeah. That's, yeah. I miss you. I'm leaving. You're going surfing so, in the USA. I'll, 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 I'll wave. I'll do like a, 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 a nice queenly wave. Oh, people. that's very queenly. Oh, very well, queenly well, of yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, nice to see you guys. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for watching. Um, Survivor Series 1992 yes. in Richfield Coliseum, Ohio. Ohio. Shout out to Ohio and any fans that we've got out there. A lot of new people are debuting on this pay-per-view, uh, which was partly due to the steroid trial in the WWF at the time. Yep. There was a lot, a lot of that those. going in. A lot of those. Needed a lot of new talent, and we're getting into the new generation period. Yes, indeed. So, as we normally do, we'll go through the wrestlers as we get to them, but there's some big names uh, mm-hmm. debuting in this Coming pay-per-view, and, and in the next pay-per-view, certainly, as well. Uh, also, there's only one traditional Survivor Series match on this card. I think that was probably after last year's Survivor Series. It was a bit disappointing. Mm-hmm. I know the number buy rate for this was lower than last year, and it this was the highest it would be for the next, sort of, I think it was 11 years or something like that, all the way through the sort of attitude period, yeah. which is a bit mad, really. Yeah, it was And well WWF celebrated. sort of, with that one pay-per-view, we reviewed and we hated it. I think it was the worst pay-per-view we've seen so far. Um, like completely demolished Survivor Series yeah. and it took them a long time to build it back up. That's not to say there weren't some great moments in Survivor yeah. Series, that's just that people weren't as interested in it. It's a shame. It is one of the sm- it is the smaller of the big four, would you say? Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. Because you have sort of Royal Rumble, which is the start of the build-up to WrestleMania, mm-hmm. yeah. and then SummerSlam, which is always good. In fact, sometimes I think SummerSlam's way better than WrestleMania, actually. Yes. Um, Next up, one interesting point is the poster, which is included on the WWE Network, contains the lineup of Macho Man versus Ultimate Warrior, and oh, sorry, Macho Man and Ultimate Warrior versus Mr. Per- uh, Ric Flair and Razor Ramon. Ultimate Warrior got fired from the company and was replaced by Mr. Perfect. Ric Flair wanted to leave, which we'll get into a little bit yeah. more during the match, a lot of drums, um, a lot of drums, and yeah. actually agreed to stay and, and got out of his contract early based on the fact that he was going to put Mr. Perfect over as a babyface, yeah. which is such a shame as well because Mr. Perfect's run as a babyface was was hounded by yes, injury. Yes, it was. You know, which yes, is such a shame because he was so good. Um, so, yeah. Please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe Indeed. to the video. Um, it's always good to hear your comments. How, yes. how, what are they going to do to that like button, Dom? They're going to fist drop it. Fist drop, fist drop. This that is, like yeah, They're going right. to fist drop the like button. We've, we, 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 we did an earlier take of this, and I really emphasized the fist drop uh, bit because I, I like, you know, we're doing a bit of Jerry Lawler soon. You know, I like his, I like his cool. And then and a, a stink face because we're doing stink a stink face. We're doing Rikishi really we are doing really shortly. Rikishi. Really very shortly. Very shortly. I'll try not to mess this one up. <laughs> or, you know, they, 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 I really like the head shrinkers, but when it comes to like, you know, like Samu versus Fatu, obviously Rikishi kind of had a lot more success. And I was like, you know, Samu's cool and everything, but I'm like buzzing for Rikishi. I'm buzzing for that. Yeah, stink man. Face. Rikishi I just, was great. You know, my, not because I really enjoyed his bum. Because that's weird, but I liked his I wrestling. I liked his wrestling skills. I liked his wrestling. He was a great mover. He know? was, but uh, I mean that anyway. family was oh, outstanding. Yeah. But we'll talk family. about that yeah, in a yeah, little yeah. bit. Yeah. Commentators, oh, please also go to Facebook, Twitter, oh, yeah. and other yeah, uh, Patreon. Facebook, Twitter, Patreon. We've got merchandise on Redbubble. Um, we'd like you to buy it. 
you, you know, don't, you don't. If you don't, you don't. But yeah, it's cool. If you want <laughs> to support, support the channel, we'll just we'll just keep going because we're bloody minded and British and miserable. <laughs> That's why I'm leaving. No, it's not why I'm leaving. It's not why I'm, already, I'm because I'm going to Boston, which is like twice as cold and there's like three feet of snow. So um, I'll probably be freezing my nuts off right now. You probably uh, are. Uh, certainly, will have a good cup of tea. I'll be drinking uh, black <laughs> American coffee. <laughs> Yay! Mm. Uh, commentators on this pay per view were Vince McMahon Mi- and Bobby <laughs> McMahon. 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 Oh God, I hate McMahon. him on commentary. And what? Bobby Heenan, the late great Bobby Heenan. Yeah, what? I hate Vince McMahon on commentary. McMahon. Um, Me, uh, Meek, Meek Mahan. And we get two new gimmick matches also in this pay-per-view, which includes a nightstick on a pole a match casket. and a casket match. A casket, a casket One's mask. very good. One's not, not so, good. so very good. Yeah, anything with a pole is not great. Uh, not, not <laughs> well, I was going to leave the reveal until we review them. Um, but that's all good. So please, uh, I hope you stay with us for the episode and enjoy it. Hit us on our road to... 753,000 subscribers, which we're on the road to right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what YouTubers do, man. Professional YouTubers is that, do stuff is that like thing? that. Is that it, apparently. Really? Yeah. yeah, you say like, oh, we're nearly at 100 subscribers. But subscribe. But, but what? But I just decided 753,000 was our goal. I'm pretty sure we're, are we are we are we barely scratching a hundred. Uh, well, I don't know if we've got ten. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> so the help first us out. match. Help us out. <laughs> two poor two poor lads from all that can't get more ten subscribers on YouTube. <laughs> give us that. Give us that. Give us a hand. Yeah. Uh, don't know what that was. But first <laughs> match is oh, yeah. the Head Shrinkers, <laughs> Fatu and Samu oh. versus High Energy. God, beware! And oh, Owen Hart. I need some high energy for this shit, right? Okay. Speak about Fatu and Samu for me. <sighs> okay, okay, let's try it this time. Okay, so Samu, not quite as cool or successful, in my opinion, as his tag team partner Fatu, but no less important. Samu started wrestling at eighteen in nineteen eighty-three. He's part of the Anoa family, of course. The Rock and Roman Reigns are in that family. And Yoko he Zuna. debuted in the World Wrestling Federation when Seiko, who's part of the tag team champions, the Wild Samoans, was injured. Um, and he helped he helped that tag team continue and uh, maintain their tag team dominance during that period of time. He was even a part of the team, like I say, while Seeker recovered. Um, before that point, he was helping them in matches. Um, after Seeker returned, uh, Sam, uh, Samu, who was then known as Samuela, which is what confused me on the first take of this, I started <laughs> freaking out. I was like, what's going on? Um, so, the, so he was known as Samuela, remaining the WWE, backing up his father and his uncle, who were part of the obviously again, part of this glorious wrestling family. Amazing. Glorious. Um, <laughs> in January 1984, he received a shot at the former WWE World Heavyweight Champion Bob Backlund, but ended up losing by disqualification. That was his probably greatest moment at this period of time in the WWE. During the summer of 1984, Samoa turned face after the Wild Samoans left the WWE for greener pastures over in WCW. He was later part of the Samoan SWAT team with AFA. Uh, obviously, again, very important uh, manager and competitor, part of the Anoa family. Um, he was in the WWE, obviously still in the WWE in 1992. He won some tag team gold under, under the rebranded, kind of very similar. Uh, again, this confused me in our first take. The head shrinkers are really similar to the Wild Samoans, same yeah. kind of look. You know, they have the bare feet, the wild hair, stuff like that. Crazy. So in 1992, we're, we're going to talk about the head shrinkers in a bit because I'm a little bit. Of, uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit more favourable to, to Rikishi just because I grew up with Rikishi. Um, not taken away from Samu's ability at all. So as part of the Head Shrinkers, they won a load. They won quite a few tag team titles. They had a good face run, actually. I was I really rated the Head Shrinkers kind of like, well, as you can imagine, kind of like a, an early day Uso. It's very, very much, very much a similar... Yeah, a lot bigger. Similar move, yeah. yeah, similar yeah. move sets and, and similar, in, well, incredible kind of athletic ability yep. uh, for uh, performance. Uh, like it, Haku, was, uh, Haku as well. Yes, was yes. was another yes. that was outstanding. Indeed, and was, we're going to talk about Haku in a minute yeah. as well. Um yeah, basically, um, there was a very short-lived gimmick where Samu returned to the WWE after because he, he kind of left and um, went uh, when again went over to WCW for for for, for a new and developed career uh, after the Head Shrinkers devolved. Uh, Head Shrinkers devolved dissolved in 1994. I went to went to um, went to WCW for a bit. Returned quite soon after in 1995. Under the Samoan gangster gimmick, um, Samoan gangster party. What? What? 
Samoan Gangster Party, what, what? that was a name. Shut up. With with Matanoa uh, again part of the fa- part, of the, part of the family, um, and basically that their whole thing for I think they appeared on TV like three times was sitting in the crowd while they watched Rikishi, who was under this kind of um, making the world better kind of gimmick thing where he wanted to help people and help kids and it was all quite quite noble and nice. Is it a gimmick or a way of life? It was a gimmick and a way of life at this time and I guess they were supposed to kind of be the foil to that but it never kind of got off the ground. Um, so he didn't continue he didn't continue uh, that gimmick it didn't really work for them um, and yeah just didn't really go anywhere in WWE um, which is sad really because like I say he was a great wrestler and a great performer but she never quite received the same kind of push or the same level of success obviously you know there were other they did wrestle for other promotions and have a decent run but again the head shrinkers and his WWE run is probably where he reached the pinnacle of um, crazy head May I ask a question yes. before you go on to the next one? Is Has there ever been a tag team where the two have broke up and had the same level of success? That's an interesting question. I don't think there is. Uh, okay, so Edge and Christian would be the closest one. Edge and Christian would be the closest. closest one. Or perhaps Matt and Jeff now were looking at Matt having a serious potential push. We will see. We'll, we'll see. see on that we'll one. We'll see. But um, no, that's an interesting question yeah, actually. There's always one less there's always the one less there's always one less than the acolytes. Yeah, the acolytes. They always, there's always yeah. one less than, I mean, when you look at say Ron Simmons though, in terms of his overall career, then perhaps it's more equaled. But outside in the WWE of course he never got past damn so yeah. you know Yeah. Um, and he'd also had success in previous stables like the Nation of Dominion. Yeah, yeah. Like so we'll look you know uh, obviously, JBL was part of that. Um, yeah, you're right. Matt it is always, there's always one. It's there's always, always one. That, there's that always ends one up. more than the other. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no. So so yeah. Same 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 formula here. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So Fatu uh, basically. So. so Rikishi basically started out in '85. Um, um, he was working for Loot International promotion uh, in Montreal. Um, he was he worked as Prince Loffer, and he was a high flying baby face. Again, he kind of apart from the high flying thing, he, he kind of although he was always really light on his feet. He was. Um, kind of continued that baby face run, and was a really good baby face throughout his career. Um, he had some nice, he had some nice similarities. He traded off a lot of that success from the Anoa family. A lot of people got behind him in his early career because of the Samoan, um, the, we'll call it the Samoan vibes. Mm-hmm. Um, all very similar gimmicks to the, to, in terms of the head shrink, is very similar gimmicks to the relatives. He was part of that for a while. Uh, obviously, as we're going as we're going through that um, during the during the first kind of kind of Samoan wild Samoans thing which was which was a huge part of of, of, of Fatu's history um, I, I, I didn't find this out before before researching the wild Samoans just just on a side note were originally uh, were managed by Paul Heyman for a little while oh really I didn't mention that before where in it was in, 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 in early early like they were part of WWE for a little while really yeah. Paul, Paul Heyman was part Paul, of the Paul, WWE Paul, Paul, Paul E. Dangerously as Paulie Dangerously. Oh, I didn't realise that he actually early, brought that to WWE. The early, the early days, yeah. Oh, right, while. okay, cool. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah, nice little nice little side point there. Absolutely. Um, because, yeah, it was, again, way back in the day, it's a bit like referencing Johnny Polo versus Raven now. Like, people just tend to forget those early, yeah. early gimmicks. Yeah. Um, so, fast-forwarding to the Head Shrinker stuff, uh, which is, again, kind of what I grew up with. Um, the during the World Wrestling Federation, um, they were they were renamed, again, from the kind of, well, they were kind of renamed, as, uh, repackaged as the Head Shrinkers. Um, they had the savage kind of, yeah, the savage hair and all that kind of thing, which we talked about before. Um, it was a good team, a really good team. I really enjoyed their feuds with uh, the Quebecers. Um, they had a couple of really nice tag team title runs. Um, I actually preferred their face work to their heel work, which was okay in terms of in terms of just just pure just violence. They did the you know they did this kind of really kind of heavy you know the, all the headbutts and all the fucking throwing everybody around. It was pretty amazing. I enjoyed that, and obviously their first few was with high energy, which kind of started out here, um, and then yeah, basically. They had, the Edge Drinkers had their day, they had their tag team title runs, which was, you know, through the early parts of the 90s. Um, mostly, mostly enjoyable from my, like I say, I always remember fearing them 
I remember mm-hmm. being quite nervous mm-hmm. around, mm-hmm. you know, being kind of nervous. Uh, the, the whole, the first time I really got into it was when they were feuding with the smoking guns, of course, Billy and Bart Gunn. And I, they, they look fucking ferocious, man, mm. like ferocious. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, like basically going from going from that to, to yeah, they, they, they kind of go from that to Rikishi, um, which was which was kind of, that was, a, that was a much more kind of fun gimmick. Um, much more exciting. It was, and it worked well with the three of them as well. Yeah. Scotty, Sue, Hottie, and Grandmaster yeah, Sex. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, kind of. I suppose it's kind of fast forwarding here, but like, the, you know, he, he, we went face when, um, like, so Samu decided to leave. Uh, I went face and kind of like had a had a brief kind of gimmick where we talked about before, where he was like this kind of feel good um, sort of. Uh, Man, you know, kind of man of the people type thing, yeah. and it, you know, and it was really cool. It was. I remember, I remember watching that and feeling really motivated by the work. Oh, my was brother doing. was a massive fan of the, of him. Really yeah, big fan of Rikishi. Like it was, it was cool. It, like I say, it was ninety five by the time he'd become a singles, you know, singles wrestler, um, and, and and he definitely worked better in that kind of face role, but he was briefly repackaged. As well, during around this period, there's a guy called the Sultan, which I was gonna gloss over, but it's so weird. Weird. Um, go back and watch the WWE Network and look at the Sultan and look at look at that versus the kind of work he'd been doing in the head shrinkers and then the face work he was doing afterwards. Mm. Kind of an odd, mm. kind of an odd uh, moment. But he was managed by Bob Backlund, the the Sultan, for a brief period right. as well. Um, yeah, so. Uh, Again, the, the Rikishi gimmick, like, which is again one of my favourites from that time, um, you know, it, it just kind of changed his whole life around, didn't it? It was, a, it did, it, yeah. It was an amazing, you know, he became Intercontinental Champion, team with Scotty Too Hot, uh, Brian Christopher, and kind of yeah, it started dancing around, and it was just an amazing period for for, for you know for that wrestler. Um, well, I mean, everyone remembers doing the worm on the playground at school, you I, know, I, and ripping up their body to shreds on I, the on I, the concrete. I never managed to do that. Did but you? Did not? You managed to, yeah. No, no, I couldn't. Do, I just flopped. Just no. Okay. But I remember kids doing it. Yeah, on the trying to do it. And it yeah, was yeah. Like, yeah. So it was a big thing, big cultural thing at the time. Yeah, one yeah. of his one of his best kind of feuds um, during his. I guess his later run was uh, quite surprising. Was with uh, Steve Austin. He had a main event. Yes, push. he did. Yeah. Um, he was found a bit to be uh, just a, a, a the day, driver. A day after, yeah, a day after he debuted um, in in the company, um, Stone Cold Steve Austin was um, was run over. Not that, not it was when he come back because he, he needed to go for neck surgery because he debuted as stunning Steve Austin. No 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 oh, no, 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 no. I'm talking about Rikishi. I'm talking about Rikishi. Oh right, so the, sorry. The, right, it was cool. the day after Rikishi debuted, um, and uh, basically uh, a year later, after Rikishi, you know, kind of turned face and done all these wonderful things, winning the Intercontinental title, um, Scotty Too Hot he was uh, basically dropped Rikishi in it. That he was the guy that drove the car to Mick Foley, who was commissioner at the time. And uh, I want a fan of this. Yeah, it was weird. It was really, it, it was, was a really it weird, weird choice. It was a and bit so, like Kurt Angle revealing that Jason Jordan oh, man, was his that's son. The weirdest, it yeah. was like it was a storyline that was built up and had some real potential, and actually, it just ended up being Rikishi who was doing it for was, the Rock. He was doing it. No, 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 for Triple H. Was, oh, he was doing no, it. He was doing, no, it, for no, the he was rock. doing it for the Rock to make the it was Rock all to, just a bit. To turn the Rock into the star because he didn't feel like Samoans were getting the yeah. the, the love they deserved. Um, in, it was all a bit in, in weak. Wrestling, but he was doing it. Triple H was the kind of was the mastermind behind it. Yes, that's right. Um, and then that sort of led to to Stone Cold feuding with after. Basically, he kicked Rikishi's uh, yeah, ass. Yeah, uh, feuding um, with Triple H feuding again. Feuding with Triple H. Uh, yeah. Stone Cold feuding with Triple H. And yeah. then The Rock, who took exception to uh, Rikishi, you know, doing this, you know, basically put shame in the family. Uh, basically, The Rock feuded with Rikishi. Of course, The Rock uh, the Rock owned Rikishi, sadly. Yeah. Um, the, uh, one of, like I say, his kind of career highlight in terms of a main event was he was part of the eight man. Um, Hell in a Cell. Hell in a Cell at Armageddon. Where he got chokeslammed by the Undertaker onto a bale of hay. Yeah, I remember everyone being like, "That's devastating. That's a really." De-. But actually, it was a, a really weak looking yeah. spot to me because I mean, this is a couple of years after the Mankind yeah, spot, yeah, yeah, you know, you which is really, just devastating. You can't, you can't really. even recreate that. Yeah. But it was very much to me. People were talking about this spot, and I remember watching it and going, "Oh, he fell into some." Shavings. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit like um, mankind and Terry Funk getting pushed off the 
uh, out in the garbage can, pushed off by the road dog. Yeah. Uh, the road warriors. Uh, the oh, what was it called? Badass Billy Gun and uh, Road Dog. Uh, 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 New Age Outlaws. New Age Outlaws, sorry, yeah. Um, so getting them pushed off the garbage can, it was like, well, actually, that's not a massive spot. They just fell in a trash can full of polystyrene. Oh, my God, they're broken in. What? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think tag team wrestling at this point, Dom, had sort of taken a little bit of a, a nosedive. Um, you'd gone from the days of the Rockers, the Heart Foundation, Demolition. Yeah. It was a really strong tag division. And now the sort of pinnacle of the tag division was probably the Nasty Boys. Earthquake and Typhoon are yeah. soon on the way out. The Bushwhackers are just yeah, nothing. Just kinda, yeah, just kind of stagnating. It wasn't a great time for them to be a tag team. Had, the tag, had, to, had they been in a couple of years earlier, then they could have really made an impact, I think, yeah, no, a, a lot more. I agree. No, absolutely. And like I say... Um, just just finishing off with Rikishi, like I say, he was such a just a great part of I think my childhood, and such a great talent. And it was interesting to see because following Armageddon, they didn't really know what to do with him. He kind of had a Dolph Ziggler like moment where they they kind of pushed him really strongly, I and mean, it didn't really work out for him. They 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 paired him with the returning Haku, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought was they again they they, they could they could have done some incredible things. They actually did had some pretty quality matches with the Hardy Boys, Rikishi and Haku. The yeah, team yeah. That they, the yeah. team that they pushed. Um, but it, they, again, they just kind of lost. They were a big team, but yeah, it's yeah. it all just a yeah. bit lost. Um, and then, yeah, basically, um, that, you know, mid-card mid mid kind of stuff through that, uh, when that kind of team dissolved. Uh, returning in 2001, had a... Had a um, had a brief kind of tag team reunion with Scotty Too Hot, which which made the you know the crowds loved it. And I, I also had a feud with Roddy Piper, strangely over right. over Roddy Piper attacking Jimmy Snooker with a coconut, like yeah, years yeah, and yeah. years earlier. Yeah. Odd reason to start a feud, but there you go. Um, Odd, was, yeah. But Rikishi was great. Rikishi did some great yeah, stuff. So. Yeah, cool. Uh, so on to the match. Are you happy to move on to the match? Have you got any other interesting facts? He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2015. He case, was, by his sons, in I case anyone, Yeah, in case anyone doesn't know, that's the Usos. Thank you. Yes, big fact there. His sons are the Usos. That's a pretty cool fact. They have a completely different body type to him. Yeah. Yeah. And they're great. The Usos have had a wonderful 2017. Um, so on to the match. So these, this is uh, Fatu and Samu versus Owen Hart and Coco Beware. Coco Beware and Owen Hart look like they've taken fashion advice from either Timmy the Mallet or Mr. Motivator. Both. Probably both. Probably both. I hated their outfits, man. It's just, it just them pants. And, and Coco Beware looks so daft in him as well. Yeah, like man. he's He was getting a bit bigger, I think, at this point yeah. as well. And it he just, was in the uh, late, later stages of his career, but still, you know, still a great What did Timmy Mallet sing? I don't know. Was it Agadu? I'm not going to oh, do, no. do, do. Don't do it. Go on, do it. No, I don't want to do it. I could do. I'm not going to do it. I could do. do. You I could don't. You are going Do, do, do. <laughs> Bugger off. <laughs> Uh, Owen Hart starts off against Samu, has a lot of drop kicks to get the advantage. Obviously, Samu was a bigger guy than Owen Hart. The head shrink the head shrinkers really look like a tag team, which was good. Yeah. Coco Beware stays in the ring quite some time against while um, against the head shrinkers while they dominate him. I think WWF knew that Owen was going to be a star yeah, and really yeah. sold him that way yeah. at this point. We've, we've talked enough about how great we think, well, I, how great I thought Coco Beware was and how much it would have, but then Coco debuted at a time when they just went pushing guys with that stature and that, and that kind no, of... No, no, he, he, he was sort of old hat and it was, by this yeah, point. Yeah, and, and that's boring, the problem, that's the problem, yeah. I think, you know yeah. what I mean? He didn't it reinvent was, himself in any sort it, of interesting way, or it, they didn't reinvent yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, but like I say, I think, I think if he'd have come in now, maybe it would have been different for him. Could have been. Because a bad man had worked really well in the WWE these days. Uh, Owen Hart well, comes no, I mean, in. I mean, like at this point in time, yeah, yeah, yeah. in our history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. I, the cartoon period. He, yeah. If he if he was actually fresh, yeah, I think he could have done really well. Yeah. Um, Owen Hart comes in with some really fast action. Of course, he's able to take out take out both members of the Head Shrinkers. Really nice work in the ring. Fatu has a nice splash off the top rope to get a pin. He moved really well for a bigger guy, so they, they were selling the head shrinkers here, and and the splash from a bigger guy always looks like a devastating yeah, yeah, move. Absolutely, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's the same when Kevin Owens does a splash. You know, it, it just feels devastating, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, 
Heenan has his pen at this point, and he, this is where they've started to draw onto the screen grabs a bit more, a bit like they do in American football a lot. And yeah, yeah. They were doing it in soccer, I believe, or football, yeah. as we call yeah. it, um, at the time. Yeah, it sort of took the piss out of American football play-by-play analysis, and he instead of it like being an, a, a, an accurate thing, he drew like a big turkey on the screen, yeah, basically, to sort of... It was just fun, playful, man. It was playful, fun. Playful. And it wasn't a bad match, you know. It was it was okay as an opening. Um, next up, we have a promo with Nails. He's been waiting a long time. Uh, when he was in Drail... In Drail. In jail, jail. He dreamed about this moment with a boss man. Um... Nails, promo man, his like voice was like, it was like he'd swallowed a load of bees and they were coming out. He sounded so scary, yeah, dude, like, yeah, bleh, yeah. Bleh, 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 bleh. a bit like Kane, but man. I Maybe just... he did the voice for Kane. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, I can never take him that seriously, but anyway. Yeah. No, no, you know. I always took Kane. This is the last time we have to see him, so that's all good. It was such a weird character, but his yeah. promos were actually really unique. Um, yeah, maybe maybe it would have been interesting to see more. I don't think he was the best worker anyway, but he fell out with the company anyway. So. Yes, he did. That's and then we have a boss man interview. Everyone knows Nails is an innocent. I am the law. Judge Dredd slash big boss man. Uh, that type of thing. That would have been cool. Oh, if, hard dad. If you'd repackaged Boss Man as like a Judge Dredd type character. That wouldn't that have been cool. That would have been nice, man. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. You, what, you put like a, a, a yeah. motorcycle helmet yeah. on it. Yeah, and just make yeah. it... Yeah, make so it. basically you want to see the Stig from Top Gear on WWF. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Okay. I don't think so. No? So the next <laughs> match is Nails versus Big Boss Man. So Nails comes down and is going for the nightstick, and this is before Bossman has even come down the ramp. Quite an interesting... Bloody nightstick on a pole. Nightstick on a pole, yeah. I, I, I'm trying to find positives in the match, and I find it very difficult. You know, um, I remember, like I say, I remember like, watching parts of this and back in the day, and like you know, just recapping stuff, and I just remember looking at it. Anything on a pole, like we said, anything on a pole. No, I think it does. No, I think it can work. Why? How? I'll tell you why. Um, we'll do the we'll do the match first, and I'll go into that because I I think there was a potential last year to have a really good on a pole match, and it wasn't to be. Um, so Bossman nearly gets the nightstick, but but uh, he's thrown off by nails. Yeah, you don't like the pole type matches. Nope. Okay, I think um the problem with the pole type match is that it overshadows the wrestling ever so slightly. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. It becomes less about them fighting in the ring, more about when they're going to get that yeah. that item. Um, the, no, I'll go carry on with the match. It feels like the only part, exciting part of the match is when they're going for the weapon, and that's what ruined the match. Uh, Bossman gets a night stick, uses it on Nails, but Nails eventually gets it, meaning whoever gets it first really doesn't matter whatsoever. Yeah. Bossman gets a Bossman slam... Yeah, not a fan of the match. I do think it could have potential, though. Like, when we had last... It, in 2017, there was an Alexa Bliss versus Bailey, and that was a kendo stick on a pole yes. match, and that had so much potential. That, yes. And it was crap, and it didn't work. I, I but you just, can have things I, like... I just don't think it works, man. I just don't think it works as a match type at all. Yeah, but I, I think the booking's wrong. Like, the Alexa bliss Bailey one, you have Alexa Bliss not being able to reach the kendo stick, right? That would have been funny and mm-hmm. interesting, mm-hmm. and she could have dominated Bailey, but still... The height advantage, she couldn't actually reach the damn thing. Yeah. Second of all, Bailey could then have the kendo, uh, the kendo stick, and and break her own rules and break her own hugging mentality. I think it's all got potential. I think any match has potential. I just don't think we see it used all yeah. that well. And I think it's hard to make it work. It's a bit like Cena versus Rusev in the flag match. I don't particularly like flag matches. Yeah, but I think it could work. If you had it done right, it just doesn't seem to... It's about playing the stake. Yeah. And that scene of Rusev match in particular was, was awful because, like, the whole hands over the thing and the whole, well, you just throw away the steps and stuff like that. You've got to really play stakes when you're going into something like this. Um. Yeah. Let, let us know what you think of on a pole match. Yeah, I'll just... No. Sorry, anyway, yeah. yes, yes, please, please. What about us- a stripper on a pole match? Would you enjoy that? No, I would not. 
good for you. It's not a wrestling contest. <laughs> it's not a wrestling contest. I feel really awkward. I've, Would you? Have you ever been to a strip club? Mm, Nails uh, would leave what? the WWE. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Nails would leave the WWF after Survivor Series, uh, still upset with Vince over his summer Sam pay. Um, and we went into a little bit more detail about that in the last episode, so go check that out if you want to find out about Nails accusing Vince McMahon of sexually assaulting him. Yes, that's, that's yes, very odd. Very odd. I next remember, up, you remember you brought that up and I was like... What? You what, man? I know, it's weird. Uh, next up, we have a Reza Ramon and Ric Flair interview. Reza Ramon's first pay-per-view debut here. Reza Ramon was awesome, man. Very good. Yeah. Legitimate he contender. Stayed, he should have stayed, uh, he stayed in that, with that name throughout his entire career. Well, I think it worked, NWO. I, think, I don't think it would have worked if he'd come in as a character. And I think that, that by being Scott Hall, it actually really worked. I disagree more, with you on more, that, more big a, time. More of a badass, I guess. But. More of a, a real person as opposed to a character. Oh, yeah. And that was what the invasion yeah. was all about. No, I see what you mean. Uh, two weeks ago, Randy Savage announces a different partner to Warrior for the match, and it's Mr. Perfect. Heenan tells Perfect that he takes orders from him, not Macho. And Perfect basically says, it's, this is on one of them round table discussion type things, Perfect is not being ruled by Heenan, and then Heenan slaps Perfect. Great little segment, this. You should go yeah. back and watch his promo. Uh, and then Perfect pours water over Heenan, yeah. which he obviously makes it look like he's drowning completely. Um, Flair is pissed off that Perfect has been walking in the shadow of greatness, because obviously Perfect and Flair have been working together a lot. And has given this all up for Macho Man Randy Savage. He's made the wrong decision for his career and will now have to deal with Flair and Areza Ramona. Keeping it spicy. Yeah. Uh, Reza Ramon says that there's only one man who is perfect and that's Areza Ramon. <laughs> uh, and if Savage gets in his way, he's going to cut him up. It's a bit violent. Nice bit violent. Nice to do. And I see, you know, I see what he did there. You know, very good. So that's a promo building up to the match. Then we go into a different match completely, which is Tatanka versus Rick Martel. Yeah. Rick Martel is in the ring with a sailor outfit on. What's happened to Rick Martel, yeah, man? man? I mean, yeah. he, he was ninety one Royal Rumble was outstanding. Yeah, they, they kind of lost his way. And Tatanka as well, like. Yeah, well, so you know, they're really pushing Tatanka. It was still an undefeated streak at this point. Um, mm. Yeah, there was a really good... Cr uh, Martel was a, a wonderful worker. I really like Martel. There was a really nice uh, body drop, back body drop early on from Tatanka on to Martel, um, which he got some really nice height on, and that's, you know, it was noticeable enough to write, yeah. it, write it down. Um, it seems like Martel's been put on the back burner since Flair's come in, mm -hmm. and also since Shawn Michaels' heel run. Mm -hmm. And it's such a shame, because he was so good. Was he as good as Rick, Rick Flair and Shawn Michaels? He could have been. Yeah. I think he could have been. I think it's a real shame that that sort of happened. I think had Flair not been in, there would have been enough room for Michaels mm -hmm. and Martel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, Martel has the advantage for a short amount of time, but it's, it's very much on the floor type wrestling. That, classic wrestling. Yeah. Um, and then on the ramp comes a clown making balloon animals. Yeah? Interesting. It's Doink. Hey! Da, 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 da. He, evil clown, right? Evil, oh, evil clown, Doink, man. This is Matt Bond, Doink. This is, uh, this is good stuff. Yeah. This is, so it's, it's quite funny. It completely distracts from the match and completely, like, yeah. you know, null and voids what's happening in the ring, but... Hey ho. Uh, Doink is scaring kids with the dogs, so like pretending that it's like attacking them with these balloon dogs. Quite funny. Um, yeah, really distracting from the match, but really nice to see Doink back as evil Matt Bond because I mm. think both of us respect Matt Bond's work 100%, 100%, with Doink. Yeah. And we think that uh, although people look back at Doink as a sort of failed gimmick, yeah. it had potential at this point and... It, it, go back and watch his. I think it's the '93 SummerSlam match with Bret Hart, and it it's really, really good, man. Yeah, really yeah. good. Um, next up, uh, Martel nearly puts Tatanka to sleep, but no, Martel gets a stiff-looking clothesline from Tatanka. 
Tatanka gets run over the top rope. It's all a little weird. There's there's some good action, especially from Tatanka, but it's all overshadowed by Donk by this point. Tatanka gets his tomahawk chop and starts dancing around the ring. Really don't like that as a sort of comeback. Yeah. Um, yeah but it stayed with him for a long time. Yeah, they were trying mean, to keep his character. I mean, yeah, but just didn't take it seriously, you know what I mean? No, no, no. And it's it's hard to go back and watch this devastating Tatanka when he's like dancing yeah. around in the ring. Yeah. Uh, a Goldberg streak by Tatanka, you know, it doesn't really back in connect. back at this point. It would have done something, I think. It would have made a made a difference to his career. But it again, did. They dropped it. They dropped the ball. Yeah, absolutely. They will do, they do that quite a lot. Indeed. Um, yeah, I think they were trying to get him over as a character in the same sort of way that they were trying to get the Warrior over, um, who they'd lost as the babyface. But I don't think it really. He never. He never reached the heights of Warrior yeah. whatsoever. I'm not saying his performance was. Not as good as Warrior because it probably was. Warrior yeah. was not a very good wrestler, but the the it it didn't get the no you know. Uh, Tatanka gets a pin for the win. Um, Doink then goes to all the people who he's given balloon animals to and pops them, which I thought was a, a nice little nice little heel move. Yeah, um, setting up a Doink Tatanka feud, but again didn't it distracted from the match. Yeah, very very odd in this context. Then we have an interview with Mr. Perfect and Macho Man Randy Savage. Perfect is angry uh, that Flair says that he's been in his shadows. Macho says that he doesn't trust Mr. Perfect, but nobody knows Flair and Ramon more than Mr. Perfect, which is quite a nice dynamic. You've got the heel who's now crossed over. Um, and that Macho Man and Mr. Perfect could be a perfect tag team. I quite like the dynamic of having Macho not necessarily trusting yeah. Perfect completely. Yeah. Quite interesting. So this match is Mr. Perfect and Randy Savage versus Reza Ramon. Do you want to do a Reza Ramon? No. Can you roll your R's? <laughs> That's, that's a no. Uh, <laughs> Reza Ramon and Rika Flair. Reza. Reza. <laughs> uh, so Reza Ramon, Scott Hall, as uh, many of you may know him from his WCW days, which was his real name and used in WCW. I think that that was a good move. You don't. That's you cool. Uh, 1980. Well, you sort of agree with me. As in you don't. Uh, 1983, he was charged with second degree murder. This really put... Do you know about this? Tell me. I will tell you. Um, It was after a shooting, uh, he shot a man with his own gun outside a nightclub in Florida. Yeah, I did hear about this. And it really affected him. There was a documentary going on. There was, yeah. There was a really good documentary. It's on the network, I think. Um, And it was was all done in self-defence, and it was later on that Razor admitted it, and it had all played into this sort of... um, Troubles that Razor was having, yeah. um, especially after his sort of left TNA yeah. time, where he become he was wrestling independent shows. He was drunk a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. He had really bad he, issues probably, with alcohol. Probably even even more of a tragic story than a Jake the Snake at the time. Very similar. Very similar. Which is actually because the Jake the Snake documentary, which is a resurrection of Jake the Snake, which was on Netflix, actually follows Jake the Snake's um, involvement with DDP. But then it oh, also, yeah. they bring in Scott Hall, and do, Scott yes. Hall meets him at an airport in a wheelchair. He was that sort of bad. And, you know, the the, the, the pair of them mm. did incredible work to turn yeah, it yeah. around. Yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, that sort of depression is a hard thing to come over. And, and Scott Hall has said before, a lot of it stems back to this incident where he had a disagreement with someone. I think it was a, there was a girlfriend involved yeah. somewhere or an ex-boyfriend or something like that. Yeah. And he shot him in self-defense with his own, with, with his gun, you know, yeah. so it wasn't like he went after to murder him. That's why it was second degree murder. Um, yeah, troubled him for years. He started off in the NWA in 1984 and he wrestled for four years in the AWA. He he had a good ring style yes, he did. when he came into the WWF. Yes, he and he... Instantly, and this is one of the remarkable things for me about Rosa Ramon, he came in and he was legitimate straight away contender for all the main mm. events. It yeah. wasn't like he was, he didn't come in with the same uh, name as Flair, but really felt just as le- legitimate as yeah. Flair did, you know? Uh, Van Gagne, who was the owner of the AWA, wanted Scott Hall to be the answer to Hogan. From the WWF, so he's trying to use it, and he'd use similar motions in the ring and stuff like that to try and put him over as a face. 
Um, he left due to the cold weather in the territory, which he hated, and yeah. went back to the NWA. And then he wrestled in, in a few smaller promotions until 1991, where he went into WCW um, and was renamed the Diamond Stud, who had a very Rick Rude gimmick. I think I saw a little bit of that somehow. Yeah. Right, right. I can't remember where, but yeah, it was very... A lot of... Just so much. There's a lot of borrowing from other people's games. Oh, absolutely. This time yeah. And, yeah, there still is. Yeah, there still is. Off floor, yeah, a absolutely. Of off a lot of other people. What's original now? It is. Um, um, I, mean, I was going to say Welcome Matt, but that's favoritism. Welcome Matt. It's, it's is it of, original? It's kind of original. Yeah, that's what it is. But that isn't like, isn't that so, why it's so outlandish? Yes, like, it is. It's, it's, it's a joke. It's cartoon. Itself. Yeah. It's cartoon in an era that yeah. isn't cartoon. But isn't isn't that why? Broken Matt, when he was on the indie scene, got over so much because that was so unique. Mm, yeah, you know, you can't say Finn Balor's unique. People have dressed up in makeup before. You yeah, know, and it's had, true. You know, um, and, and, and it borrows from the Undertaker. Like, I agree with you. Welcome Matt would be the closest thing yeah. to to a, a unique gimmick these days. But it's not going to get appreciated. But anyway. Anyway, um, anyway, by the time this is released, it might be over, and he might Do be I headlining think. WrestleMania in a couple of weeks' time. It won't happen. Uh, May 1992. Just like, just like, just like um, you know, attacks Braun Strowman, gives him a twist of fate. Yeah, man. The twist of fate is suddenly devastating. Yeah. Um, in May 1992, he joined the WWF and was rebranded by Vince as Razor Ramon. And it's mm-hmm. quite interesting, actually, if you listen to their story. Mm-hmm. I think um, Vince wanted him to be nicknamed Razor and... Uh, R- Scott Hall had sort of said to Vince, I want to be this character. And he basically, he described Tony Montana or um, Tony Montana, sorry, mm. or Manny Rivera from Scarface. Yeah. He basically pitched him that idea and Vince was like, that's so original. Yeah, let's yeah. do it. And his old vignettes, when you come into the WWF, were all very based on Scarface. Yeah. And, and even like he's saying, which was um, say hello to the bad guy. Yeah. Was say hello massively. to my little friend. Yeah, you know, it was, it's all very similar. Um, so yeah, he, he had weeks of vignettes uh, debuting him. The, you can get them on the network. I've seen them a few times actually, where he's in cars and stuff mm. like that. Quite similar yeah, to Eddie Guerrero, out, out actually. Some, yeah, out in some kind of cafes or whatever. Just yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. T- you know, he was being in proper heels. Yeah, he? absolutely. Yeah, um, and then his in-ring debut was August the eighth. So that's not long prior to Survivor Series, but again, main event straight away. You know, he really fa- and he's a finisher, man. That, that, yeah, yeah, the wow. Razor's Edge, man, incredible. Uh, this match was supposed to originally be Warrior Matra, as we said, um, but I can sort of skip that because we've already said it. Um, also huge in the WWF for Razor Ramon around this point was on Monday Night Raw, and this was um, about half a year later when he ended up being beaten by the One Two Three Kid, which would help push Sean Waltman. He wasn't even called the One Two Three Kid then, was he? He was called he was the, the, the kid. kid. Yeah, just yeah. the kid. Yeah, and then um, he got that One Two Three Kid nickname because of the win. Because of the win over Reza Ramon, and that really helped push uh, Sean Waltman. Yeah, developed the click in many respects. Developed a lot of wrestling history from from this man. Massively, you know, massively. massively. Yeah. And we're just waiting for Kevin Nash to turn up now and then. Yeah. Um, uh, Hunter Hearst Hemsley, you know. Um, yeah, Razor's finisher, let's talk a little bit about that, because it was unique. Well, it's really only like a powerbomb where you're holding them from yeah, behind like your back. Yeah, cross, yeah. But it looked nasty. He did the whole thing that Jake the Snake did where he'd call for yeah. it beforehand, so people got excited to see it, especially when he was as a face. And that's, I think, part of the reason he works as a face. Mm. I think whenever a face can call a finisher and it gets the crowd cheering it's, yeah, it's, it's good deal, work yeah, yeah big, big deal. deal um and the next few years i mean i'm not going to talk about all the scott hall just as sort of what's happened but in the next sort of few years you have an incredible matches um one outstanding possibly one of the best wrestlemania matches mm. it, it was it's certainly the best wrestlemania match since um macho man and ricky steamboat at wrestlemania 3 is with Shawn Michaels in a ladder match, and that oh, is outstanding. Incredible. And incredible. WrestleMania 10 is incredible with Owen Hart and oh, Bret Hart as well. So good. But, um, yeah. And obviously, the, the departure into WCW was such a huge... had such a huge impact mm-hmm. into the Monday Night Wars and got so many people to stop watching WWF and move over to watch Monday Night Wars. Yeah. I think WWF need to... And I was talking a little bit about this earlier... They need to be careful at the minute because they seem to be pissing off a lot of superstars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Letting people like 
Shinsuke disappear, Finn Balor disappear. Obviously, last year Neville got upset with him, and I I worry for WWE. I think that they are on tenterhooks. Yeah, They've signed so many top tier talents, but there's no, they don't have but there's not enough time. Them, yeah. And if people leave, like you get, you like say you get Daniel Bryan in the ring at WrestleMania, mm-hmm. or it may have happened when this episode's out, yeah. and then he's gone. And he takes a load of guys with him. And you would have the exact same thing that happened in the Monday Night War. Yeah. Which would be excellent for wrestling fans. Yeah. Not necessarily very good for WWF. Um, Great. So let's move on to the match. Um, Flair and Ramon come out together. But Macho enters first and introduces Perfect as his tag team partner. Mm -hmm. Um, So Flair was leaving at this point for WCW. And... McMahon had said to him, because he was under contract, and McMahon had said to him, look, we'll let you out of your contract early, but before you go, we need you to put over Perfect, because we're going to make Perfect a big babyface. They just lost the Ultimate Warrior, and they needed that top babyface in the company. Yeah. 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 Sad for Perfect, because it didn't really work out because of injury. Um, Never kind of panned out for him as much, did it? No. And with Perfect being such a great talent and also not a major part of the steroid trial, mm. it made sense to make sure Perfect And they sure could have made him into put. something massive. They could have made him, you know... They could have like done. A, like a Daniel Bryan for that kind of day. You know, to an extent, yes. To an extent. I agree. Um, yeah. Um, so it starts off with Perfect versus Razor, and the match feels big. The crowd are behind mm-hmm. Perfect mm-hmm. to this point, which is great work by Flair to have done that. Yeah. Uh, Flair is angry that Perfect is getting advantage of Ramon. Uh, Flair comes in, and they both start wooing at each other. Flair did his job, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Flair did his Constant. job at making Perfect look awesome. Um, with the fast move and, uh, and taking some great shop, uh, chops from Perfect. Yeah. Uh, absolutely excellent. Flair did another great job of being in, in great positions for Perfect and Macho Man. That's really important in a match to make sure that you're in that position for the faces to make the move. And Perfect did wonderful at it, man. Uh, Macho comes in and starts slapping Flair in the face. Loved it. Macho demolishes Flair and Ramon. Both of the faces looked incredible. Razor did a good job of keeping up with Savage, I think. A, a really good job especially yeah. new to the company. Um, and Razor had had such a ring presence in the ring. He really felt like a major contender. Yeah, really cocky, really confident. And his body looked yeah. outstanding, yeah. man. Yeah, the best, really good. The best he's looked for a long time. Uh, well, it's the first time. But yeah, I think he... Because he lost it a bit well, later sorry, on, yeah, in, he, terms but, yeah. in terms of his rest of his career. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, it's Macho who ends up on the losing side of the heels, mm. uh, building up to uh, the pin from Perfect. Again... Flair does this great thing where all the refs backs turned clapping. I love that. Yeah, so that, yeah. you know, the tags happen, but it hasn't. Perfect starts leaving the match, walking up the ramp, and then uh, comes back. I didn't really like this. This was all about perfect. Is perfect going to help Macho or leave him? Um, can 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 we be trusted with perfect? Yeah, can they coexist? Yeah. yeah. I think it just it added a little bit too much of a potentially cowardly heel thing to perfect. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Macho is in the ring for a hell of a long time, being beaten by Flair and Ramon. Um, Ric Flair keeps taunting Mr. Perfect. Perfect eventually gets a tag against Razor, and then Perfect beats up Flair and Razor. Perfect knocks the ref out of the ring. Razor goes for a Razor's edge, but Perfect flips out and gets a Perfect plex. By the time the ref gets in, Razor kicks out, and Perfect gets a second Perfect plex on Flair. The second ref comes in, but Razor breaks up the pinfall. Really tight yeah, spots, really nice. man. I yeah, mean, really, nice. really good storytelling in the ring. Um, the bell rings. Flair snaps a figure of four uh, leg lock onto Perfect, whilst Razor gets a chair. Mm-hmm. But Savage gets in before he can hit Perfect, sending him falling backwards over Flair and Perfect. Great positioning yeah. by all of the guys in this. Perfect gets a chair whilst in the figure of four and beats Perfect off him, which I thought was really nice, like really aggressive, actually, uh, followed by hitting Razor. Um, the ending of the match I don't really like the referee's decision is that he disqualifies Flair and Perfect I don't really know why because we're doing too many t- double team moves yeah, this, yeah. again, again you, we think we're out of that time we were talking about before where you know these, these things happen but mm. some weird decisions yeah because it was a great match yeah. it was a really good match really solid. Perfect looked great as well like, he one did of, one of the best times I've ever seen Perfect perform everyone in this match looked outstanding yeah. and and even and I think Flair did such an amazing job in this match to yeah. sell Perfect I in the way that he did yeah. like 
Incredible. Um, Savage and Perfect are left in, left in the ring, but Perfect is hesitant about high-fiving Savage. Eventually he does, and the crowd go, Yeah, he's a good guy after all, because he can give a high-five. Swerve. Uh, no, <laughs> there was no swerve. Yeah, amazing showing for Perfect. One of the best, ta- certainly the best match we've seen Perfect yeah. in. And, and One of the best we'll ever see him in, to be honest. In yes. In the WWE ring. Yes. Um, and then we have an interview with Flair and Razor backstage. Razor was crossed once before. Um, you can ask him if you can find him. Yeah. Odd. Yeah, I don't think that was supposed to be referencing the man that he killed, do you? No. Probably not. Um, so next up, great match. You enjoy that? Really good. Probably. Really good match. Yeah. Uh, uh, totally solid. And like I say, took two or four people that I... I cared about Flair and I cared about Savage, but not that much, and it made me care about him more. Yes. And then it took Perfect, who I just wasn't interested in at all. And, and it, just, it, just, it just... It just... Turns ex- you. Exceptional. Just and that, that's how people felt at the time as yeah. well. And that's why Perfect has such a, such a name he does. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just his undefeated streak. So, next up, we move on to Virgil versus Yokozuna. Uh, Yokozuna's pay-per-view debut here. So, Dom is going to talk about him. Yes, I am. Yokozuna, one of the greatest big men in WWE history. Uh, Obviously, an incredible... He was part of the the Inoue family, but was kind of billed as a sumo wrestler. A um, Japanese. A Japanese sumo wrestler, which is, you know, quite interesting. Um, I love the character when he first came in. An incredible heel. um, Aligned himself with Mr. Fuji. Just so dominating, so frightening. He was, was, yeah. When I was talking about how the head shrinkers kind of frightened me um, back in the day, there were a lot of wrestlers that kind of kind of really scared me quite a lot back in the day. And Yokozuna was one just because of the sheer power and ferocity and, and just size skill. as well yeah you know a lot of you know just just incredible talent really um it it was odd you know it was odd to have a guy again who was part of this family and a lot of people he, he had such a wrestling history it was odd that he was repackaged in such a way yes you know because because when you really look at it it's Apparently Hawaiians are not threatening enough, so yeah. we make him a mega. Yeah, I mean it's an um, anti-American heel. It's an odd one. I mean, but he had some really cool moments. One of the tag team titles with Owen Hart, which was really great. Yeah. Obviously a world champion. Uh, really great feud with Bret Hart. Yeah. Very much underappreciated face run. Yes. Which is which is, which is there. On. He had some quite cool kind of uh, face moments there. Um, and yeah, just an incredible talent. Um, basically, kind of his early his early kind of career was 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 celebrated. He had some really good kind of ma- he had some really good kind of matches in the early part of the WWE, dominating guys like yeah guys like the One Two Three Kid and guys like Marty Jannetty, and then later obviously uh, obviously just kind of turned into this monster heel as part of like you know like I say these ta- these tag teams with Owen Hart I mean that was one of the greatest tag teams in history it was great yeah. um, absolutely incredible um, it really built up Owen Hart as well yeah, especially oh, for massively, his feud massively. yeah massively uh, 1993 King of the Ring um, and the, like like I say those feuds are very much like Bob Backlund who we talk about really soon uh, with, with, with Bret Hart kind of defined what he was doing, you know, yes. what, as a performer on the whole. Yes. Um, 93 Rumble win yeah, as well. The third fastest newcomer in the WWE history to win the title behind Brock Lesnar and Sheamus. Oh, really? As well, which is, which, yeah, which is, which is a nice fact. Um, I mean, like I say, it's just sad because he could have done so much more, I think. Um, but but it's just sad that obviously he's, you know, like I say, just really sadly taken from us very early on in his yeah, life. struggling with uh, his weight. I mean, he, he was weight. constantly trying to get bigger. And the size of him at this pay-per-view mm. is is not big compared to how he ended up. Yeah. He was constantly putting on weight. Yeah. But at the same time as that, you've got to battle with the fact that you are an agile performer who's in the ring as well. Mm-hmm. So it's that sort of interesting balance. He celebrated, I think we watched a, was a thing on the network and he, was, he talked about the greatest big men. And, um, you know, like I say, he just celebrated as one of the, you know, kind of paving the way for bigger guys that could move yeah. and do super kicks that look fucking amazing. They did, and yeah. All, yeah. You know, all these... Coming, all, coming out of nowhere, all these super kick. Yeah, post, you know, posthumously, you know, he was conducted into the Hall of Fame in 2012. And like I say, his WWE career is kind of where he really, really made you know such an impact on a global scale. 
Um, did Yokozuna come to? I can't remember if Yokozuna came to Hull, but I remember. Yes, he did. I remember, like, like I say, just uh, yeah. Uh, uh, he had a casket match yeah, for the Undertaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like I say, I can remember just the size of 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 Yoko. I mean, when I, when I, when I, when I say I can't, it's just like one of those things. It's like almost unbelievable. I'm like, did did he come? Because it's like yeah. I just remember the size. Yeah, because in that house house show run, they were doing this whole gimmick where it was a casket match with the Undertaker. And Undertaker would push him into the casket, but it was actually a small a, yeah. a, a casket that was too small, and the casket had exploded. Yeah, and that's what we saw. Yeah, yeah. No, like I say, just just the the, the pure, just ah, amazing. You know, to see that, to see that yeah. up close and personal. What what an yeah. incredible athlete. Yeah. Um, but yeah, one of the greatest uh, big men in WWE history. Um, the most intimidating person on the roster at this point. Even I think his finisher as well. The, the bonsai uh, drop. Well, no, it's the, it wasn't called the bonsai drop. It was called the giant tea bag. Anthony. Well, we're losing earthquake. I've got to have a tea bag somewhere. Be professional. <laughs> 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 yeah. Cool. Anything else? Um, no, that's my. That's cool. my. That is my. Yeah, my, part of the whole I realize. I realize. I kind of went on with Rikishi, so I'm keeping, <laughs> keeping really it brief. Really well, you like brief. Rikishi, so that's all good. Yokozuna was great as well. So Yokozuna versus Virgil. Who's going to win this match, Dom? Uh, Virgil, man. I yeah, love Virgil. Virgil. Yeah. I love Virgil. Yeah, that's not happening, is it? No. Always uh, <laughs> fun for the underdog, man. <laughs> The problem with the match is, yeah, it's, uh, I get it. It's 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 almost a, it's just a squash yeah. match, but you know, uh, Yokozuna was doing the sumo tradition at the start of the match. So that was uh, really nice, actually. That mm-hmm. sort of he really felt Japanese. Yeah. It wasn't until I got older that I realised that he wasn't at all. And you know what, man? I, I like I say, until I started researching for this podcast, you didn't even know. Well, no, well, you know, <laughs> it's one of the you you know you look at it, you're like. I can't believe yeah. I thought that was a thing. But, yeah, yeah, no, part of the Inoue family, yeah. Like, like you know, the super kicks of everyone. Roman Reigns doesn't do a super kick, does he? He has done one before. Has he? Yeah. Was it any good? No. Mm. Surprising. Um, <laughs> Yokozuna, um, yeah, it taunts in the ring, throws Virgil around the ring with ease. Virgil slides under Yokozuna and does multiple drop kicks, but he stays standing. Yeah, Yokozuna mean. eventually does his backward super kick, which was brilliant for such a yeah, big guy. Yeah. Really excellent. Um, yeah, Yokozuna, belly to belly. I mean, that is when a belly to belly looks awesome. You, just, you, know? you don't want to. You don't want to mess with that. Do no, you, you do, like, and oh. and that really works. I mean, you know, belly to belly sometimes can nah. look a bit near. Yokozuna belly to belly. Yeah. That was a belly because man. There's, a, there's a, one Rhino does, which I think is really great. Yes, but yeah, like, but again, he's a bigger guy. Yeah, yeah. Believable that he's sort yeah. of throwing you into it. Um, belly to belly is a really weird move for me that sort of doesn't always work. But Yokozuna, mm. man, it looked devastating. Yeah, if you, if you like you versus like Bailey and Charlotte, you got the you lock in the you know the, the figure oh, a version of the figure four. Or that looks, you know, whereas like you look at belly, belly to, it's just literally, it's just, yeah, like, yeah. it's just a belly to belly. It is, yeah. You know, yeah, it's like yeah. it's just a belly to well, belly. Sometimes it's a belly to belly off the top rope. Yay! Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think Yokozuna at this point looks in really good shape as well mm. compared to what he does slightly later on in his career. Yeah. I think, is it WrestleMania 10 where he has mm. two matches? Yeah. And you sort of, uh, it's one of the WrestleManias, yeah, and you sort of think, why did, what of all the guys to choose to do two matches, why did you choose the guy who was massive and, yeah. you know, he really struggled. I think it was WrestleMania 11, that, I think, mm. against Lex Luger and Bret right. Hart, I think. Yeah. I mean, the Luger match was... <coughs> was the, so, yeah, the Luger, the thing was quite short, relatively, but... Yeah, he, he didn't have the stamina. To, he did, yeah. at this point, a lot better than he did later on in his career, yeah. I'd say. Uh, Virgil tries to <laughs> scoop up Yokozuma. Uh, yeah, no. Going for want, the cheap pot slamming. there, Virgil. Do you know who was the first person to slam Yokozuna? You remember that? Uh, it was Hogan, wasn't it? No. Luger. Luger. It was Luger on a battleship. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. It was the, the tribute. Uh, to the, kind of like an early tribute to the troop. Yeah, well, there. it was all the the. It was all a contest to see who could slam Yokozuna, and no one could do it. Mm-hmm. And then Lex Luger arrives by helicopter. Da, 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 da. That's Indiana Jones. That's, there was no helicopters. Um, Virgil tries to scoop up Yokozuna but falls back in. I've already said that. Um, quite funny, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, Yokozuna wins with the giant tea bag off the second the turn buckle. Drop. The giant tea bag, basically. Earthquake's tea bag, but we're losing earthquake quake soon, so I'm turning that into the giant tea bag. Um, do you know that was a really dangerous move actually there's been a lot of people that have said like 
if if Yokozuna had fallen back too much, it would have just crushed your sternum. Yeah. Like, it was really dangerous. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, because he lands feet match. first and then... Yes. But it's all... It's kind of... It's the yeah, but if he fell back, I mean, oh, yeah. he was a big guy, yeah. surprisingly. Um, yeah, a bit of a nothing match, really, but a nice sort of introduction, I suppose, uh, in some respects to yeah. Yokozuna. Um, then we have an interview with Perfect and Macho. Macho wants... Uh, Perfect wants to give turkeys to Razor and Flair, obviously. Survivor Series is the Thanksgiving weekend. Turkeys. I don't understand why turkeys. Mm. Yeah. No. Um, and a mini chicken for Heenan. Ha, 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 ha. I don't like, I don't like the Thanksgiving references yeah. in these buddy yeah, pay Yeah, they're a bit... It's, it's always a bit... I mean, respect... You know, respecting American, American tradition. Well, yeah. I, I wonder if they were trying to give Perfect a Santa gimmick. Yeah. Oh, did they ever do a Santa gimmick? Mick Foley had one just for Christmas. Yeah, just for Christmas. Yeah, he would he'd love that, didn't oh, he? he loved Santa, it, yeah. yeah. Uh, next up, we have the Nasty Boys and the Natural Disasters versus Money Inc. and the Beverly Brothers with the Genius and Jimmy Hart. This is a feud that's begun because Jimmy has turned his back on Earthquake and Typhoon and instead mm-hmm. he's gone in favour of helping Money Inc. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, quite quite an interesting story. Not the best, but it's it's okay. Uh, and this is a tag team elimination, and and probably how you do a tag team elimination. I've spoken to you in the past how I hate yeah. like ten people on ringside because you can't even get the cameras in too to much, see the too action. Many, too much. Way too many. Um, this eight men is sort of a better format for me. I I, I don't mind it as much. Um, the nasty boys in our face team, yay! And I think they worked really well as a face mm-hmm. team. Actually, quite funny. Um, it was exactly the same as there was when there were heels, but just over. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, they still did all the sort of grossness and stuff like that, and, and that's what, that was the gimmick. Uh, so we have one of the Beverly Brothers against Typhoon. He tags Earthquake, and they pass him over into a bear hug. Thought that was a nice um, transfer into the ring. Mm-hmm. Uh, a nice power slam. Earthquake tags in knobs. The face continued to dominate. I felt a little sorry for the Beverly Brothers. They never sort of worked, but they did have some good matches. Yeah, well, um, they were just... It was too really, generic, man. The gimmick yeah, was too generic. Too generic yeah. uh, but they're both talented guys. Sachs comes in with a cracking side slam on one of the Beverly Brothers. Look great. Mm-hmm. And their faces continue to be in control at this point. Until DiBiase comes in. Uh, DiBiase was always a legitimate threat, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. He's the sort of leader of that stable. I don't know if he's a tag team at the moment, but he always felt like a stable yeah. money because he, he had money all over the place. Um, yeah, even though it didn't last long enough that DBSC was in charge and that was part of my major problem with this match the faces dominated a little too much mm-hmm. for me um, making it slightly boring at times even when the Beverly's did have the advantage on Sags the team doesn't have enough heat to build up the yeah. crowd you know um, and it should have been Money Inc. that were in that position, I think, instead of the Beverly Brothers. Uh, Earthquake does a nice job of clearing out the ring, including all the faces coming in, and a nice backslam from Typhoon, followed by Earthquake, uh, Earthquake teabagging one of the Beverly Brothers for the pin. We get two teabags in this pay-per-view, one from Yokozuna and one from Earthquake. Enjoyable. Awesome. I'm enjo- I am enjoying it, man. You might enjoy licking my forehead. I enjoy teabags. Uh, Money Inc. do a double-team slam on Earthquake. Actually, quite impressive. Yeah. Looks looks devastating. Um, Earthquake was in the ring for a long time, taking a lot of the heat um, against Money Inc. And it isn't until Earthquake gets his foot up as DBS is coming off the top rope that he gets the tag. Yep. Uh, IRS gets the pin on Typhoon, but IRS is celebrating and Nobs rolls IRS for a quick pin. Um, yeah. I think it could have done with another heel team for the money yes. team. I don't think Beverly Brothers was right in this situation, mm-hmm. but um, it was an okay match. I prefer the format of this match. Yeah, maybe that's why I enjoyed it a little more than I should have done. Yeah, but um, and maybe two teams is slightly smaller. Maybe three teams is the perfect number. Yeah, I don't know if they've ever done that, but it'd be interesting to see. Um, just to make it a bit more fresher with fresher people in the ring but none of these guys were known for being able to come into the ring fresh and, and they, stuff like that were, you know? yeah they were much more kind of they were just, just heavy set competitors yes just, yes really, yeah. um, we see uh, a media uh, this is this is a great 
video package of uh, Kamala and Undertaker at SummerSlam with that amazing look from Kamala when Undertaker yeah. sits up and oh, yeah. Kamala just like he looks like the dude from yeah. WrestleMania yeah. when I don't know if I said that in the last episode you know when, yeah, when he loses yeah, his streak yeah. it's like that is Kamala in 30 years time great stuff man uh, great video package we see Paul Bearer going and pushing a lot of caskets into Kamala's matches yeah. uh, as soon as he'd see the casket we'd get the same look from him again and, so, and yeah, yeah. so funny man I love Kamala it man. was so funny give him a cuddle. you know this is like his well, biggest he hard, thing he was a hard dude he was in the WWF for ages he was, he he was just, a hard no, he, he, oh in real life yeah, yeah he was yeah, yeah. yeah and he went through a lot of rubbish which we talked about in our last yes. episode so go and watch it uh, we see Undertaking making a cask Undertaker making a casket for Kamala. Uh, Kamala will not survive Survivor Series. Rest mm-hmm. in peace. <laughs> casket match. Undertaker with Paul Bearer. Kamala with Harvey Whippleman and Kim Chi. Mm-hmm. Kim Chi was interesting. Yes. Uh, Rorschach Max from um, Watchmen. Yes. That's what odd. it looked like, isn't it? Very odd. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was fine. That was, um, we talked about Kim Chi, didn't we? I think uh, so. The, uh, the Brooklyn Brawler. Yes. Yes, I'm sure we did talk about that. Uh, Kamala comes down in full outfit with an uh, African mask and shield. Look great. Mm-hmm. Kids in the audience have dressed up as Paul Bearer and The Undertaker, mm-hmm. really showing how over they are and how iconic they are. Yeah. You know, still get people dressing up as Undertaker and Paul Bearer. At Hall- we should do that next year no, for Halloween. Do we'll do it every podcast, mate. Who's going to be Paul Bearer and who's going to be Undertaker? I think you need to be Undertaker. Yeah, I think I need to be Paul Bearer. Yeah. Sorry. It's yeah, It's fine. Gutted. Oh yeah! <laughs> oh yeah! It's out of the better Paul Bear. Can you do Undertaker? Dude, you're too small to be Undertaker. I'm Rest being Undertaker. <laughs> um, Undertaker easily gets the biggest cheer from the crowd so far that we've seen. Uh, whilst Paul Bear pushes the coffin, adjourned with Kamala's body paint on the coffin. Um, Kamala, man. Great job of looking afraid as they're walking. Then I love, I love yeah. Kamala's looks yeah. so good. Uh, at the start of the match, he's running away from the Undertaker, but starts chopping him as he mm-hmm. comes into the ring. Undertaker was always a really slow, methodical worker. Yeah, um, not in a bad way. I'm not saying that in a bad way. Uh, Undertaker walks the ropes, holding Kamala's hands and patting him on the back. That's my new way of saying old school. Mm. Yes, uh, Undertaker gets a clothesline over the top's rope and starts choking both of Kamala's managers before getting rammed into the steel steps. Just decided to give you a back rub. Thanks, man. Um, I had a problem with this spot. It was the exact same spot that we saw at SummerSlam. Like, exactly yeah. the same. I mean, the guys will have been touring the house show and just, you know, let's give me something a bit different. Mm-hmm. Let's not do exactly the same. Um, Kamala gets a scoop slam on Undertaker, but he keeps getting up. Um, that's the right way to use Undertaker, not Survivor Series last year yeah. with the Hogan fiasco. Um, Kamala goes for a splash times three on the Undertaker. Wow, he must be. Undertaker's going to stay down now. Doesn't. Paul Bearer stands up on the ap- apron and Kim Chi, Kim Chi steals the urn. Passes it to Kamala, but he fumbles it, and then Undertaker ends up attacking Kamala with the urn, mm-hmm. and then gets a three count, um, pushes Kamala, Kamala into the coffin with ease, and Undertaker hammers the coffin shut. Not the best casket match. No. I enjoy Kamala's work in it. Um, I prefer it when there's no pin. I don't really see the point in a pin mm-hmm. into the casket. Surely the idea is casket... When you get when the casket lid ch- closes, you it's over. That's what yeah. they did later on. Yeah. Um, but you know they're working out on a gimmick match, and and we saw much better casket matches in the future, and that's all fine. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's a cracking match type for Undertaker to give him his own. Yeah. And and sort of this was the synonymous match of Undertaker until Hell in a Cell come about, yes. which then become even more synonymous with Undertaker. Um. Next up, we have a Shawn Michaels interview. Sherry is injured after Michaels dragged her in front of um, in front of him during a match with Marty Jannetty. This builds into the Royal Rumble a lot more. Um, so we'll talk about that in the next episode. Uh, Michaels has beaten British Bulldog for the Inter- Intercontinental title and Bulldog has won it off Brett, meaning um, that he can easily beat Bret Hart. Yep. Easily. 
Um, and it's only Brett's title on the line here. Uh, an interview with Brett Hart. Brett Hart has defeated Ric Flair at this point to win the heavyweight championship. Um, and he won Flair with the with the sharpshooter. Um, yeah, in many respects, that would have been nice to have seen possibly at this pay per view. Yeah, I don't think there was a lot of build up at this point to Brett and Sean. Um, could have been better to have saved that and and mm. let's see let's see Rick and and Brett in this match. Um, so for the World Wrestling Federation Championship, champion versus champion, Brett Hart versus Shawn Michaels, an interesting match. Not perfect to have problems considering with it. their considering their future and their, they had better yeah. matches. Yes, yeah, much better. Uh, some great mass wrestling at the start with Hart keeping hold of. Um, with Shawn Michaels keeping hold of Bret Hart the entire time, it made them feel like legitimate wrestlers, you yes. know, that sort of college yeah. wrestling. Yeah. Uh, the two can really keep pace with each other, and that, that was sort of the good thing at the early start of the match. There was no big moves, but the sold, the arm wrenches, mm -hmm. and the reversals, they did really well. It was just a bit of a slow builder, I think. Yeah. Um, McMahon tries to advertise Ico Pro during the match. So we've still got the, was it WBF? WBF, World Bodybuilding yeah, Federation, WBF, yeah. that's still going, Ico Pro is still being sold by WWF, that was a massive flop. Um, yes. Yeah, it, this is a problem with McMahon, because the match was getting a little bit slow, and then the commentary just starts going into advertising and yeah. boringness, and yeah, they can't yeah, even can keep it going. That, yeah, yeah, you can tell he's you not know. that into it. Uh, lots of back, back and forth starts happening, uh, including a really nice section where Shawn Michaels hangs Bret Hart on his chest on the top rope. Looks really nasty. Hart clotheslines a turbuckle as Michaels moves out of the way. Again, Michael gets Hart in a headlock and uh, slows him down big time. This, this is a problem. It's about 15 minutes into the match and it doesn't feel like a lot's happened because yeah, no. of these sort of slow... Yeah. And although that works to legitimise them as wrestlers, it doesn't build up any excitement uh, or enough excitement. Um Hart runs into a nice drop kick from Michaels, which is sort of one small point. Mm -hmm. We get to see Hart using a nice swinging net break on Michaels. Um, yeah, but again, way too long into the match to still be seeing headlocks. This is like 25 minutes or something, death yeah, like that. Yeah, it's... Hart misses an elbow off the top rope. And so, so slow compared to, the, like I say... Just what they do to... later on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and like Sean and Razor and stuff, wow. Um... Sean drags up uh, Hart to take the advantage and we see a shoulder barge, goes for a pin, misses and goes back into a freaking headlock again, man. Yeah. You know, you start to get really bored of it. Uh, Brett delivers a nice looking backdrop, which Michael sells, bouncing over in his uh, over the top way. Oh, that yeah, I enjoy. I, I always enjoy seeing that. Yeah, man, Sean Michaels did. And whenever he got Irish whipped into the an corner, artist, man, he was an artist, man. He was great. The last five minutes of the match is when it really starts to pick up with bigger move. Um, Brett almost, and I've noticed this in his match against Skinner at this Tuesday in Texas, was it? He he has like this very much like, it's the five moves of doom, and it's like uh, a move and then go into a pin and a move and go into a pin. I, it gets a bit, I'm starting to see it in Hart now, and it's getting a bit predictable. Yeah. But, you know. Um, Hart suplexes Michaels off the top rope, which was good. Um and then there was a beautiful moment where Michael backflips over Brett. I don't think you knew who was going to win this match. Mm -hmm. But again, it's just the first half of the match that's too slow. Uh, Michael gets his super kick on Hart, but Hart... Was it was it called Sweet Chin Music at this point? Or was no. that when he started to tune up the band? Yeah, yeah, that was... yeah When he started to tune up the band, it became Sweet Chin Right, music. cool. It was just a super kick. Yeah. Um, Hart rakes Michael's eyes, but Michael slams Brett and is getting really frustrated that he can't pin Brett at this point. There's a really nice moment where Michael's locks his arms in the ropes, but uh, as Brett runs to dive into him, he moves out of the way in the last seconds to leave Brett hung up on the ropes. Very good technicians. It's just a shame the whole match didn't have this sort of intensity. Michael dives off the turnbuckle to double drop kick Hart, but Hart catches him into the sharpshooter for the win. A really was, nice yeah, setup, was, I thought, for the win. I love, I love, to be honest, I always really like that. Whenever that happened with Brett, and it happened quite a few times with his more high flying opponents. I think That's after the Bulldog match, because we saw a really interesting yeah. way that he got into the sharpshooter yeah. then, I think he was starting to experiment with how to get into the sharpshooter yeah. without yeah. it being an obvious sort of move. Um, yeah, and then it's a nice set of the win. Obviously, the sharpshooter wins for mm -hmm. Bret Hart. Mm -hmm. And then we get Santa Claus coming into the ring. Ding, 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 ding. It starts snowing. Yeah, it's, yeah, snowing. Wrestling. Uh, if I yeah. had my way, wrestling shows and pay-per-views would ignore the holidays. 
<laughs> you are such a Grinch. That was the Grinchiest know, thing you've ever said, I know, man. I know it would never happen because obviously advertising, but <laughs> but yeah. You'd say, I, I what just, about, but yeah, there's some fun. Just ignore him. What about uh, the 12 no. Days of Rusev? No. Last year. No. That was that was beautiful, man. No. Although, it is, it, I am quite excited to see Rusev as a face now. Hell yeah. Uh, anyway. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um, yeah. I think the whole match would have been better as a 15 minute match, not a sort of yeah, they long did. match. They Way too did. many headlocks. It was a 30 minute match and it felt slow. They and you shouldn't be saying that with Michaels and Hart. No. Nope. No. Um, so that's the pay per view. Dom? Mm, I'd say. <sighs> it's a difficult one, this, because I really, you know, like I said, there's a lot of debut wrestlers I really like and a lot of positive yeah. vibes. The mic, you know, the mic. But I don't think the debut's had a great showing. Mm. I think Yokozuna it was just a squash match. I, I'm probably probably give us a two. I'd and say then two. I'd probably, you know, I'd probably say the, the match of the night would have been the obvious one, with which both you and I have praised, but you. Um, you, you you loved it was the tag team match yeah you know I mean? it's good yeah really good match uh, best performer I think would go to Ric Flair mm-hmm. I think it, yeah it, like perfect looked amazing but it was because yeah. Flair was doing Michael's it Michael's always does an incredible job but, uh, but it was yeah. just too slow yeah no, it was I just agree. too slow man. Um, and yeah best match for me perfect match for Flair I think you can always tell when my best yeah, match is 100%. Um, although the championship match was okay it just didn't didn't live up to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, ta and ta-ra. Indeed. Uh, Keep the game. <laughs> oh, do, do our sell stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, buy our stuff from Redbubble and cool. Patreon, but more so Patreon because it all goes directly to us. We really appreciate, not because we're not because we're going to steal it all and, and use it to buy Porsches, but because we need to fund this podcast. It would be really <laughs> nice to have more help financially. Yeah, man, we need a better but camera and stuff like that. We need a better camera, yeah. stuff like that. But we're not going to beg you. If you don't, if you don't want to, you don't have to. Just keep watching. We appreciate Yeah, man, but love. what we do really like, appreciate is interacting with us yeah, on Facebook, Facebook and Twitter, Twitter. And social media. And, like, you know, keep like, it going. Come hell or high water, like... like like we'll do it if we're ill we'll do it if we're sad we'll do it if we're happy we'll do it if we're like dead inside as human beings we'll just do we're it never all dead the time inside. I'm dead inside you, like dead you are at the minute like, I smelt you when you went to the toilet earlier on <laughs> that smelt like death well I've been ill doing this podcast oh. I've been ill and I'm you've done a good job for dude. you guys you do the what are you doing trying to fist keep it gay keep it gay I'm just doing the Hogan thing you know, go the, on there do it yeah. you for you guys I've gone through shit quite literally <laughs> so so yeah cheers keep it gay bye <laughs>